Hello, and welcome to Bridges Church in downtown La Crosse, Wisconsin. I am Annalisa Hunter, and I serve this faith community as its pastor. We are honored that you have chosen to spend this time with us today as we build bridges to God and our community. This service is first shared on YouTube at 9.30 a.m. on Sundays. After the video, we gather on Zoom so that we can talk with each other with our reflections on the Bible readings and on the message. We also share communion together, and then we just check in with some fellowship time. You are welcome to join us for that Zoom time. Just check out our website at bridgesdowntown.com for all the information for our Zoom meetings. Let us now take a moment to clear our thoughts and open ourselves to God's presence. As a symbol of your openness to God, I invite you to hold your hands palm up as we pray. Loving Shepherd, you know our names. You care for us. When we face darkness and death, you walk beside us. When we hunger for your love, fill us with your presence. When we are fearful, feed us at your table. May we dwell in the house of goodness and mercy all the days of our lives. Amen. Our first reading today is Psalm 23 from the Old Testament. God, my shepherd, I don't need a thing. You have bedded me down in lush meadows. You find me quiet pools to drink from. True to your word, you let me catch my breath and even send me in the right direction. Even when the way goes through Death Valley, I'm not afraid when you walk by my side. Your trusty shepherd's crook makes me feel secure. You serve me a six course dinner right in front of my enemies. You revive my drooping head and my cup brims with blessing. Your beauty and love chase after me every day of my life. I'm back home in the house of God for the rest of my life. Jesus used the metaphor of a shepherd several times in his ministry. In this passage from the Gospel of John, the sheep know that the shepherd really cares about them and offers what they need, good, abundant, green pastures to eat in. They recognize the shepherd who takes care of them as they hear his voice. A reading now from John chapter 10. I assure you that whoever doesn't enter into the sheep pen through the gate, but climbs over the wall is a thief and an outlaw. The one who enters through the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The guard at the gate opens the gate for him and the sheep listen for his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Whenever he has gathered all of his sheep, he goes before them and they follow him because they know his voice. They won't follow a stranger, but will run away because they don't know the stranger's voice. Those who heard Jesus use this analogy didn't understand what he was saying. So Jesus spoke again. I assure you that I am the gate of the sheep. All who came before me were thieves and outlaws, but the sheep didn't listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief enters only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came so that they could have life, indeed, so that they could live life to the fullest. There are so many ways to live life to the fullest right now, or as another version of the scripture calls it, living life abundantly. Being together, either physically or virtually, is one important way for us in this moment. Perhaps we can keep up some of the connection habits that we have been developing after this time of isolation. This next scripture from the book of Acts, chapter 2, shows us the value the early Christians, some of whom had to gather in secret and isolation, were supporting one another with life abundantly. From the book of Acts, the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the community, to their shared meals, and to their prayers. A sense of awe came over everyone. God performed many wonders and signs through the apostles. All the believers were united and shared everything. They would sell pieces of property and possessions and distribute the proceeds to everyone who needed them. 
Every day they met together in the temple and ate in their homes. They shared food with gladness and simplicity. They praised God and demonstrated God's goodness to everyone. The Lord added daily to the community those who were being saved. In these scriptures, we see the desire of God for us to be taken care of, for us to live to the fullest, and for us to support one another in having abundant life and community, food, and gladness. The thief in the first passage could be anything that robs us of those things. Sometimes the sacrifices we have endured because of our attempts to slow this virus can feel as if we've been robbed of our well-being. But we can also turn that around and see that these sacrifices are how we share goodwill and well-being with each other. Our hearts overflow with the grace and guidance we know from the shepherd, and we want that goodness for everyone. Glad and generous hearts overflow with love in many ways. May the words of my lips and the meditations of my heart be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our Redeemer. Amen. This week, I've been really thinking about what does it mean to be church and why should we bother? Because when we look around, we see most people aren't going to church right now. The last few weeks, we've been twisting ourselves into knots trying to figure out the best way and the best technology to be able to continue to be the church online. What cameras should we use? What microphones should we use? Where should we be? How should we do all of this? I saw an article in the Washington Post talking about how a lot of churches are struggling financially and that it could be that some churches don't make it through this difficult time. What was most interesting to me is my husband also read this article, and I don't read comment sections for anything on the internet because I know it's just a rabbit hole that I don't want to go down. But my husband sometimes is more courageous than I am. And he started scrolling down the comment section. And he texted me later, he said, great article that you found in the post, did you read the comments? I said, no, I didn't read the comments. And he said, you know, there's really a lot of people that actually are hoping the church dies. There are a lot of people who really believe the church brings nothing to our communities. There are people who believe the church is just a place of exclusion where more people are kept out than are welcomed in. So that makes me think, why bother? Why go through all this work trying to be the church, trying to keep going? When I got to the scripture readings today, I think God has a message for us. I think he has several messages, and one of the wonderful benefits of the Holy Bible is that every time we read them, God has an opportunity to speak to us in a new way. So when I came to Psalm 23, one of the best known sections of scripture, there was a part of me that just kind of races through it because, you know, I've read this before. I memorized it back in second grade. I know this. But reading through it today, I was really struck that this is a deeply personal psalm. This is all about the comfort and the compassion that God gives to us as individuals. God is promising to take care of me. Now, I don't know about you, but I keep looking through the internet trying to come up with some information of what's going to happen next. How is the economy going to go? How is the virus going to go? What's going to happen? How dangerous is, is this? What are the risks? What are the choices I'm going to be making in the coming days and weeks and months? And I can't get the information anywhere. I have people that I find who are saying all sorts of stuff. None of it is anything that I'm willing to bet my life on. But here in Psalm 23, we see that God is willing to walk by our side no matter what we're going through, and he's going to lead us to the other side. I find this deeply comforting, as do so many generations of believers who have memorized this 
and held this psalm close to their hearts. As we move into the John passage today, I saw something a little bit different. There's still the promise of abundant life. There will be pastures, there will be enough to eat. We will be taken care of. But that's the point. We will be taken care of. A whole flock of sheep, a whole herd. Jesus came not just for me, but for us. Jesus is here to redeem all of creation, not just individuals. Out of curiosity, I did a little bit more digging on the internet. I mean, what else do I have to do right now? I found a website run by Kippix Farm from the United Kingdom, from England. And they were explaining the life of sheep, because I'm not really into the whole sheep thing. I know we have some folks in our congregation who would know a lot about this, but it's not me. And they talk about the flocking instinct that sheep have. Because when they are together in a group, they have greater protection and safety against predators. When they are together, they can care for each other, and they can move together, and they can be safe. The other thing about flocking, though, is that they need a leader to show them where to flock to, where they should move as a herd, where they are going. And I think this is where we see Jesus fitting in here again. Not only is he here for the whole herd, the whole flock, a whole group, everyone in creation, Jesus also was willing to be the leader who went ahead. He showed us the way. We follow him and we know we will be in a safe path. Now right now during the pandemic, I don't think any of us feel like we're flocking together at all since we are all socially distant. And loneliness is a very real thing right now. Just like sheep, humans want to be connected. We want to flock. If you watch the news this week, there were all sorts of humans flocking to beaches that may or may not have been officially open in California or Florida. Spain was lifting some of their lockdown restrictions and there were people flocking to run and walk outside and get some fresh air. The old saying is, no man is an island. And we are trying every idea that we come across to get off our island and to be connected to other people. There's been drive-by worships and drive-by parades I hear even drive-by, drive-in movie theaters are coming back. Of course, we've been trying Zoom and different computer technologies here at church. We've even just called each other and written letters. We want to be part of a flock and a community, just like those sheep. So then we come to our last Bible reading today from the book of Acts. And Acts is more of a historical book. There's a lot of different types of genres or types of books in the Bible. Some are poetic, some are prophecy, uh, telling people to turn away from what they've been doing, to go in a new direction. Some are historical, and the book of Acts is really the second part to the book of Luke. The two really go together. They were most likely written by the same person. And so you could read those front to back, you know, read through Luke and read straight into Acts to get an idea of what Luke, the author, was trying to capture of what Jesus was teaching and how the early community of believers was living out those teachings. So in Acts, we read that they shared what they had. They ate together. They took care of each other. This was the opposite of loneliness. This was the cure for loneliness. Many of these people may themselves have been socially distant and isolated due to persecution or living in a community where they may be the first household of Christian believers and everyone thinks they're weird. They prayed together, they had communion together, they shared clothing and housing and food. They even went so far as to try to create systems to make sure they were taking care of everyone and no one fell through the cracks. Which brings us back to my initial question, why bother with church right now? Why work this hard? And I think that perhaps 
These scripture lessons maybe give us the point of church today. Maybe the point of church is to be a meaningful flock of believers following Jesus. Jesus is providing the leadership. He's leading from ahead of us. We follow behind. He shows us the way. Now, as Bridges Church, over the last couple of years, we've been spending a lot of time trying to figure out what direction we were being led in. And one of the things that we've come to see in Jesus' teaching is that there were five core spiritual practices that he used to lead his believers, to lead the herd of believers. And these were praying, learning, serving, giving, and sharing. And if you use all five of these practices in your daily life, you will have a healthy physical and spiritual life. You will have a connection to community, to gain encouragement and support and deal with loneliness. You will see a community that cares for their marginalized people, the lonely, the poor, the sick, the elderly, the very young. And we will have a healthy connection to God. When we do all five, we get connected to God and we get connected to community. Now, when I go to Barnes and Noble and I wander through the books on the shelves there, there's a ton of books about, well, they're called self-help books, how to make your life better. Five steps, seven steps, 13 steps to a better you. This list of five spiritual practices isn't how to make me better. It is how do we come together with Jesus to make our community better, to redeem all of creation that is broken and separated from God. Church is not a self-help group. We don't come to church to make ourselves better. We come to church to be connected with others so we can work with God to redeem to heal the brokenness of our world. We flock together to provide comfort and safety for people. We come together to make sure no one gets left behind and that everyone is supported. So as Bridges Church, how do we live into this vision of a group of believers following the way of Jesus? When you look at the, what some people are starting to call the bubble map by our front door that you can see on the screen here, we have five bubbles showing the five spiritual practices. And for the bubble of prayer, we come together every Sunday and we worship together online. Most of us also have personal prayer at home. We pray, we have devotions, we offer the Upper Room devotional series for free here at church. If you'd like a copy of it, let us know. We can either deliver it to you or mail it to you. The second bubble of learning, we've gotten pretty good at here at Bridges Church as well. We have Bible studies and study groups that meet online on Sundays and Wednesdays. And again, we're a community. We support each other during this time. Plus, we learn more about God and how God wants us to be living in the community. This month in May, we're going to be expanding because we realize that one of the areas that we're missing out is we can't provide Sunday school for our little ones when we're not here in our building. So we're going to try a month's worth of a curriculum called Orange, and we'll be getting that sent out to our families to see if that's something that can help them as they and their children continue to grow spiritually. The third bubble is giving, and our congregation has a tradition of extravagant generosity. We have, as a group, committed to giving 20% of our offerings of the income that this church receives to ministries outside our buildings. So right now we are uh, this week sending off another $2,000 for a total of $4,000 this year to the Connectional Ministries of the United Methodist Church around the world. But giving is not just about money. Jesus does teach that the tithe is encouraged, which is 10% of our income. But he also says that our giving should be sacrificial. 
So no matter how much the amount is, we should be giving just a little bit more than we think we can afford to show that we are trusting God to provide enough for us. And beyond money, we also have time and talents that God has given us. And we can also tithe or sacrificially give of our own abilities and our times to be able to grow God's kingdom. The fourth bubble, share, is about faith and hospitality. How are we sharing our faith with others? What opportunities do we have to share the God moments in our lives with others who maybe don't know God? What hospitality do we offer to strangers who wander in? We have a group of people that are meeting right now to try and pull together a hospitality team so that when we do reopen, we are ready to meet and serve anyone who comes to our church building. Now the bubble that I think we have the most work to do on and that we will be concentrating on in the coming months this summer is the area of service. Now as individuals, we are a phenomenal faith community where almost all of us are volunteering our time in an area that God has given us a passion for. We have people with jail ministry, with the warming shelter, with community gardens, with conservation efforts. We have people serving in all sorts of different ways to help our community and help our neighbors. But as a congregation, we've been busy with all sorts of different things and we have not yet come together to make an intentional commitment to one or two partners that we will be working with to transform the world. One of the things we've talked about, several of us give loan money through the Kiva.org program as a way to help people both in the United States and around the world who have made decisions to improve their lives through training for financial management and business to take a loan out to be able to expand their business, their uh, agricultural activities so that they can better support their families and pay for education and food and clothing for their children. So maybe one thing we can do is to set up a church loan fund through Kiva.org that all of us could go on there and pick out some loans that we can help with around the world. We can continue to work for justice advocacy with the Board of Church and Society, umcjustice.org on the internet, and there are ways that we can connect with our elected officials to change the systems that create injustice and marginalize so many of our neighbors. I also think there's a possibility that the future is deeply unknown at this point. And it could be that things could get seriously worse before they start to get better. And we may need to be open to the idea that we may have to become more like the church in the book of Acts, where we may need to set up some sort of fund where we are doing more sharing to make sure that everyone within our flock is taken care of. When I think about what the purpose of church today is, I just go back to what Jesus taught. And when I look around, the world. The church, I think, is the only way we move forward. There are lots of great nonprofits doing great work in very focused, specific areas, and that is wonderful. But they're not taking care of everyone. There are governments that are taking care of all sorts of things, but they can't take care of everything. And at the end of the day, when I look around the world, the church is the only organization that truly cares about people from cradle to grave, every age range, every race, ethnicity, no matter what your background is, no matter where you were born, no matter where you're going, no matter your economics, no matter your style. The church is the only place that has the potential mission of redeeming all the brokenness in the world. And that's why I think it is worth my time and our bother to keep church going during these difficult times. We come together, we live our five spiritual practices, and we become a healthy flock that is going in the way of Jesus, and we are bringing health and wholeness to the world around us. 
Jesus is our shepherd. He is leading our way, both for us individually and for us as a group. This is our purpose. Not just a personal highway to heaven and God's comfort, but a community of faith and resources to keep each other safe and, sure, and share God's abundant life. Let us pray. Loving Shepherd, thank you for the abundant resources that you have promised to give us when we walk beside you. Today, give us the courage and the inspiration and the imagination and the creativity to be able to stretch out and see the next person that is looking for the way to healing and wholeness. Show us how to reach out to them and bring them in so that we can continue to share abundant life with our communities. In your name we pray, amen. Let us now take time to lift up our prayers for our community. Holy Jesus, our compassionate leader and shepherd, we want to call to mind the people we cannot name, whose names we do not know, but we know they need our prayers and your comfort. We pray now for those who have lost loved ones, for those who are sick and recovering, for those who are caring for loved ones who are sick at home, for those who are caring for persons in medical care, for those who are separated from loved ones, for those who are feeling alone and isolated, for those who are helping and are so very tired, for those who are struggling to find friends, food, and comfort. For those who are afraid. For those leaders who are facing difficult decisions. For those who are aching to return to work. Shepherding God, you guide us with your voice. Help us to listen and follow no matter where your voice leads. Help us to trust you. Lord, we pray for those who don't know the shepherd, whose life circumstances kept them from knowing the good shepherd. We pray that by our actions, our behavior, and our reaching out into the community, they may come to know you. Shepherding God, renew us, guide us with your love, and renew us with your peace. Amen. At this time, we offer up a prayer for all the financial gifts that our community has given to support our ministry as we build a church here that brings healing and wholeness to our community. We invite you to share in our ministry by giving online at bridgesdowntown.com. You can also mail any payments that you would like to make for our ministry to our church. Let us lift up together our offering prayer. Like the disciples of the early church, we offer what we have. They offer their company, their table, their bread. We invite you to be with us, Jesus, as we offer you our love, our devotion, and these gifts. May our eyes be open to your holy presence among us, now and always. Amen. Thank you for coming and worshiping with us today. We would like to leave now and give you this blessing. We know Jesus is present among us even in this online community. We will not let fear be louder than love, but with glad hearts and rejoicing souls, we will sing God's praise. For we are Easter people, resurrection people. As we close this time together, remember God is always with you. No matter what you face, no matter what trials and hardships come your way, God is right beside you, offering love straight from the heart, guiding and directing our paths. So acknowledge your fear and your worry and know it is as true and holy as any other feeling, including joy and hope and love. Take heart. Go in peace.
Amen.